are delighted to welcome you today to our CBS Family Service. If you are watching us on Hope TV or listening on Hope FM, or those of you joining us live on our Sitem Church online social media platforms for the very first time, we extend a very warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining us as we take time to worship and hear from God. It's our pleasure to provide this very special online worship experience today. Please share your comments throughout the service and please share the link with others after the service for their benefit as well. Thank you for staying connected to the Sitem Broadcast Service. God bless you and please enjoy the rest of the service. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us from. Thank you for making time to join us for the CBS Family Service. I will be your moderator today. My name is Elaine Mbithi. And I'm joined today by some familiar faces and some other ones that are new. And I want you to join me wherever you're watching us from to welcome this new amazing CBS worship team. Help me give them a clap. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. So won't you join us when we worship and as we praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So join us wherever you are as we raise the highest praises to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Come on, let's go.
Lord of victory is in your house and it is in your home. Amen, amen, amen. So I invite you to just stay with us because after the sermon, we're going to continue with our time of worship. Well, it's now time to hear the word. And our speaker today is Deputy Bishop Karita Mbagara. And his title for today's message is Prayer of Adoration. Let me say that one more time. Prayer of Adoration. And as you watch and listen, feel free to comment or share a question. Our hashtag today is Let's Adore. One more time, Let's Adore. Now let's welcome our Deputy Bishop Karita Mbagara to share with us today's message. Greetings in the name of Jesus. I trust that you are well and God has taken t uh, good care of you as you come to this service today. We want to read from the book of Psalms 145. We will read verse 1 to 9, but we'll refer to the whole psalm. So if you have time later, please read the whole psalm. It says, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and exalt your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Our Father and our God, as we think about what is recorded for us in this psalm, I ask that your presence will be with us to give us insight and to bless your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. D.L. Moody was an American evangelist, a great one at that. He was also a publisher. He is also the one that started the Moody Church. And it is he that said, I would rather be able to pray than to be a great preacher. Jesus Christ never taught his disciples how to preach, but only how to pray. The question is, why would Moody place such a high premium on prayer than preaching, and yet he had seen so many people come to faith through his preaching. I think it is because, among other things, he recognized that life is founded on prayer. The power behind preaching, the power behind successful ministry is prayer. And consequently, it was more important for him to learn how to pray than to learn how to preach. I also want to say that prayer builds our character not just our reputation. Let me explain. When I talk of character, it is who you are. And you see, when you pray, you address God. You're speaking to the mighty God who is caring and who is interested in our affair and who you cannot lie to. So you tend to be more honest in prayer than you know what people may see of you because reputation is what people see of you but character is who you are so when you're a prayerful person it will build your character and that's what god is most interested in however when we talk about prayer many of us think of petitions asking god for things but that is not the case prayer involves many other things and that's why for the five weeks starting today we will be speaking at the different aspects of prayer we'll, we will follow an acronym that we is popularly known as acts a stands for adoration where we will be talking about worship c stands for confession where you confess either your failures your sins and things that you want to see happening in your life and T stands for thanksgiving, 
because God has been gracious to us, we need to give thanks. And S stands for supplication or petitioning. And that's the part that we seem to specialize in, asking for things. On the last Friday, I mean Sunday or of this series, we will be talking about, um, uh, uh, about the power of praying together. So five great Sundays. You don't want to miss any. Today, we will focus on adoration. Adoration peppers all kinds of prayers throughout the Bible. When you see different people praying, you will see that they have uh, adoration put in their prayers. It rarely stands alone or it's on its own, except perhaps when it is a doxology. And I will give an example of a doxology towards the end. But let's first define what is adoration. A simple definition of adoration is praise or worship. It is when we exalt God or lift him up for his worthiness in, in our lives and in what we have come to know of him. This praise involves complimenting God for who he is and for what he has done. It is just like how we would compliment people. For example, you have a child who has performed very well in school. You may say, you have done well. Your performance is excellent this time. In the same way, we can go to God and say, God, you are excellent in all your works. Some people will know that we have athletes that are great in this country. And uh, some of them are record holders, world record holders. And you could compliment such an athlete and say that uh, the world is yet to see a greater athlete like you. We could say that, for example, of our sister, Faith Kipiegon, who has broken two records in a very short time. And, uh, you know, you could compliment her that way. But in the same way, you could compliment God and say, what a great God. There is no other like you. Maybe you meet somebody who is very smart and you tell them, you look the part. Your threads have everything uh, that they could be. But you could also go to God and say, your glory, your power, your majesty is awesome. Or a worker, after he has you know, done a great work, you could say, you have been an awesome worker as you are him towards the end perhaps of a contract. But you could say the same of God. God, you have been awesome in my life. You have done excellently. And uh, I want to. That is worship. When we come to worship, there is a certain kind of heart or attitude that we should have. And that's the next thing that I want to talk about. When Jesus spoke about worship to the woman of Samaria in John chapter 4, he said that God is spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And that tells us the kind of heart that we should have. Now, I want to note that different uh, versions of the Bible use the word spirit to indicate either the Holy Spirit or the spirit of man. So you may find some versions of a, 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 a big S or a capital S, meaning the spirit of God, or a small S, signifying the spirit of man. And what I make out of that is that when we are worshiping God, we need to be aided by the Holy Spirit. And that is consistent with what the Bible teaches in the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 26, where it tells us that we don't know how to pray, but the Holy Spirit aids us. The Holy Spirit uh, helps us. But if we were, take it, we were to take it that it is uh, from the heart of man that you know, that Jesus was talking about, then we can see that he is telling us that our worship must come from the recesses of our hearts. It must be from the alcoves of our heart. It must be that it is deep. It is meant we are conscious of what we are saying and we are recognizing that God is spirit and we are worshiping him in that manner. But it is not just that. 
it also says that it must be in truth. We must be genuine. We must be real when we worship God. We should not be fake. We should not be hypocritical. It is not that we should flatter God or be pretentious. And you know in Matthew chapter 6 verse 7, he talked about the, the Pharisees and rebuked them because when they prayed, he said that they use flat, uh, flattering words, many words, but they, it doesn't flow from the heart. So Jesus says that our hearts should be yielded. So it's talking about yieldedness when he talks about the spirit. But also he is talking about honesty, truthfulness. That is how we can worship God in a manner that is going to be acceptable. There are people who will worship God in different ways, but it is not acceptable. Therefore, like in all other prayers, adoration is to be uttered not just in flowery words, if you have the flowery words. What is more important is truthfulness, not flattery, but something that is coming from deep within. And if that is going to be the case, I think we will be required to be men and women of deep reflection, men and women that contemplate as we read the scriptures, as we interact with the prayers that we find in the Bible, then we will try to, you know, get into the depths of what these people were saying and craft our own words in our worship to God or even adopt the words of such people. Contemplative because we don't want to present that which is not acceptable before God. The second thing that I want to point out as to the heart of worship, it should go beyond words. And I hope this is coming out from what I have said. For example, when Mary came to Jesus and anointed uh, his feet with a very expensive oil that provoked uh, uh, feelings uh, from uh, Judas Iscariot and said that we should have sold it. You can read this in the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 6 to 13. I would say that was an act of worship. It is not words that were used, but her act became an act of worship. And I want to say, we can also worship God in our actions, the things that we do. That's why sometimes you will hear somebody say that when we are giving, it is an act of worship. The giving that is sacrificial, the giving that is out of a heart that is dedicated, committed to God, that will be worship. Even our service, when we do our service to mankind on behalf of God and we do it conscious of the fact that I am doing this for God, then it will be an act of worship. So it is an act of adoration, not just when you speak, but also in your actions, in your deeds. The things that you do for God should show that you truly are a worshiper and God is looking for such people. Somebody by the name of James Drake described this act by Mary by saying that it was unrestrained. It was not contained. It was, uh, it was extravagant. And when you love somebody, when you love God, you will give him the very best that you have. Secondly, he says that it was reproachable. You cannot reproach. If anything, she was commended. And Jesus said, wherever the gospel will be preached, this act will be talked about. And that's why we are talking about it. That when we love God, we will do things for him. We will honor him and glorify him in the acts or uh, that we, we undertake for him. He also says that it was unsurpassable. You cannot exceed it. And I, and I think it is to say that when it is coming from the heart, that's the ultimate. When it is coming from persuasion that we love God and we are responding to, be, to him because he also first loved us, even before we loved him, then... It cannot be, again said, it cannot be surpassed. 
That is the kind of attitude with which we should approach God. But the question is, why should we adore God? The passage that we read uh, has many things, and I may not be able to do every one of them. Psalm 145. By the way, this is the last psalm by David and the only psalm that is called a psalm of praise. And the summary of it is this, that the incomparable God, he cannot be compared with anybody else, is praiseworthy and should be worshipped by all at all times, indeed forever. You find that in verse 1 to 3. It says this, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. That is repeated, that it should be continuous. And he says in verse 3, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. So when you consider that, it is telling us that we should worship, all of us should worship this God at all times and indeed forever. But when you read the psalm further, you will find that it is personalized. David is talking about his worship and he is saying that we should worship God for his greatness. He says we should worship God for his grace that saved us. We should worship God for his goodness and compassion. He says that we should worship God for his glory or his majesty and might, his righteousness and kindness. And finally, we should worship him for his providential care. He says that when God opens his hand, he satisfies everybody. He satisfies the birds. He satisfies the animals. He satisfies human beings. He is a very good provider. For his providential care, we will worship him. And he, he invites us, therefore, to worship him day by day, to worship him from generation to generation. We should worship God from nation to nation, not just one nation. All nations should worship God from need to need, even when we have need, God is to be worshipped because he's the one who supplies to those needs. And from prayer to prayer, we should present it to him. Notice that the psalm is telling us to worship God for who he is because of his character, his attributes, but also for what he has done. Let's take who he is, for example. The attributes of God that demand adoration are found, for example, in verse 3. Great is the Lord, most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. And when we read verse 8 and 9, it says, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. This is his character, that he is compassionate. He is slow to anger. That's why he has not destroyed us. He is rich in love. And verse 9 says, the Lord is good to all. He does not discriminate. His goodness is extended to all humankind. Maybe even we could say his goodness is even to the animals because he provides for them. He has compassion on all that he has made. He is a merciful God to all. But we could also add other things that we know from our own experiences, that God is perfectly holy. He is triple holy. That's why we sing holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And yet, this holy God reaches out to sinful man to deliver him from his sin, not just to deliver him, but to place him in an awesome place. Uh, in a privileged place or position, a holy God that does not look down upon sinful men, but, you know, reaches out to, to them. That is something for us to worship God for. He is totally just and merciful. When we talk of justice, we are saying that we all deserve to be destroyed by this God because we have sinned, we have fallen short of his glory, but God 
is also a merciful God. How, do, how does God balance between justice and mercy? I tend to think that when we live in sin and we refuse to respond to his love, then we remain under judgment or because he is a just God and he must punish sin. But when we repent, when we become like the people of Nineveh, Jonah chapter 3 verse 10 says that when God saw what they had done and how, what and how they had done because they had turned to him, animals included, they were made to fast and people were crying out to God. Then God forgave their sin and saved the nation. Brothers and sisters, our God is a merciful God, and for that we worship him. This God is the mighty creator of the universe, of the universe yet he is mindful of humble, small, tiny human beings, but he is the God who created the galaxies. He is all-knowing. There is nothing about the past, you know, he doesn't know, or something about the future that is new to him. He discovers nothing. He knows all things from the beginning to the end. He is all-wise. There is not a decision that he doesn't know to make in any situation, in any circumstance. And we have already read that he is full of goodness. And then we have Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is in a privileged position, and yet he is self-sacrificed to the extent that he will leave his glory in heaven and come into our world, into our time and space, and die for us as sinners. His love is beyond comprehension. Isn't that something that would invoke in us the desire to worship him. We have the Holy Spirit who walks with us, who guides us, and who knows that we are ever falling short. Even when we have turned to God, we keep falling away. But like a patient mother who goes after a child that is learning to walk, that keeps on falling and sometimes in mud, the Holy Spirit also pursues us and brings us to the paths of righteousness and to the paths of godliness. Brothers and sisters, this Godhead is to be worshipped. But we have said that he also ought to be worshipped, not just because of his character, but because of what he has done. And this needs to be differentiated from thanksgiving. This kind of adoration needs to be, uh, to be differentiated from thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a debt of reception. You receive something, you say thank you. It's only fair to give thanks. But the adoration that comes out of this is driven by wonder, by magnificence, or the majesty that is, you know, uh, brought out or displayed by the acts of God. You see what God has done and you want to worship him. For example, that he has created the world, put it in perfect order, so that the sun rotates at the right place, we are told if it was to move one inch closer to the sun, we would all be burnt. But God is a perfect creator, and that is something he has done that should cause us to worship him. But perhaps it's best to illustrate it. In the book of Psalms chapter 8, the, Bible, uh, the psalmist says this, Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. The psalmist is saying, Lord, you have done great things. When I consider the heavens, the glory they are in, I just see your majesty. And that is part of his worship. Then he says that he uses the children to bring perfect praise. He perfects adoration by those that perhaps we would look down upon and despise. He also goes on to say, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, 
When I look at the galaxies, that is not in the scriptures, it's me who is adding. But his words are, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, human beings that you care for them? You see, the psalmist is saying, I am so small. Or human beings are so small, and yet, God, you are mindful of them despite your great power. Wow, this God deserves to be worshipped, deserves to be adored, to be lifted up, to be exalted, to be magnified. And when we do that, he will bless us. What is the value of adoration? Why should we do this? Uh, Adoration to me is the core, it is the essence, it is the foundation of true worship because we acknowledge the worthiness of God. It's important for us to actually recognize us, to recognize that when we come before his presence and we say we want to praise and to worship him, it is to bring our hearts to bear the goodness of God and to present it back to him and just tell him, Lord, you are worthy. You are awesome. You are wonderful. It is not about us. We should not say that we are praising and worshiping when we are talking about us. And like I said, it, our attitude must be right. We must be yielded to him and we must be genuine. We must be real as we worship this God. But also, I have at times wondered whether God, you know, adores himself. If not... He must be very pleased when we bring our adoration to him. And even if he adores himself, which I don't think he would, I think he is very happy when we adore him. No wonder Jesus praised adoration high up when he was teaching about prayer in what we have come to call the Lord's Prayer. He taught us to say, our Father who is in heaven or who art in heaven, he is not on earth. He is an exalted father. So it starts with the exaltation. But he goes further to tell us that we should say, Hallowed be thy name. Respected be your name. This word Hallowed is rich in meaning. It means that revered is the name of the Lord. Sacred is the name of the Lord. Holy, consecrated is the name of the Lord. And he, we start there before we start saying, even praying for his will. Let your kingdom come. We start with adoration, a recognition of who he is. And when we recognize who God is, it gives us faith. It gives us confidence. It gives us assurance. We are able to face life in a, you know, in a more positive way because God is a great God. He is an awesome God. Hallowed be thy name. Let me also say that when adoration is truly about God and it is not pretentious, it helps us to be aligned to God's perfect will. And the will of God is the basic requirement for answered prayer. So if we do proper worship, then we are likely to receive uh, answers to our prayers because we'll be aligned to his will. You cannot sincerely adore God for, you know, for his perfection in every way, that God is perfect in every way. And thereafter, you are fretting about life. If God is in charge of the world, if God indeed is the one that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or imagine, and you're persuaded about that, and you have worshipped him in the same way, I mean, in, in that manner, then you will be more courageous to face life. You will not be fearing and wondering what will happen. I want to further say that adoration informs our relationship with God. It also informs our conduct or our service. And maybe I'm repeating myself here from what I said earlier. And therefore, our in a debt service for God is a testimony to our lack of reverence for him. 
when we are not given to you know to this relationship of adoration and devotion to God out of the fact that he is a great God we are likely to serve God in a mediocre manner but when we recognize who he is when we have fallen in love with him and we are talking about and uh, responding to him in the manner that we have been describing then our service also will honor him we will give him the glory we will give our inner selves to him not what people see we will give value to him we will be energized as we serve God so that we serve with a lot of enthusiasm a lot of energy not complaining not always murmuring like the people as they were walking out of Egypt to the promised land we will be spared that our worship our true worship will lead us to a place where our relationship with God is a relationship of love a relationship of grace a relationship that is meaningful allow me to give a, a few examples from the bible where i see worship there are many many places especially in the book of psalms and i would encourage you to read the book of psalms and uh, underline as many places as you find but the first one is in the new testament in the book of romans chapter 11 verse 33 to 36 This is a doxology or what is called a liturgical formula of praise or worship or adoration and Paul in this place who is the writer of Romans is coming to an end of a discussion that he has had about you know God's election and the sovereignty of man from chapter 9 10 and 11 he has been discussing that he has given his uh, answers to what he thinks about that but he also realizes that this is beyond human comprehension and uh, comprehension and that's why he writes and says all oh, the depth of the riches this is verse 33 of Romans 11 all oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out that God is all wise he is all knowing and he is unsearchable in terms of the decisions that he makes we cannot be able to trace them verse that for he says who has known the mind of God who has comprehended God fully it would seem to be saying or who has been his counselor his advisor who has been the one giving him instructions on what to do verse 35 who has ever given to god that god should repay him of course we are all custodians of the treasury of god he has given us out of his treasury different gifts different abilities even life itself is a gift of god and paul is saying who therefore can say that i have given god no matter how much you give it is because god was the first one to give and he closes by saying for from him and through him and for him are all things to him be the glory forever and ever what a worship what an adoration that he brings by recognizing the character of god the nature of god the acts of god he is the one who gives everything he gives to all the, you know that live on earth and therefore he gives him all the glory another passage is first chronicles chapter 29 verse 10 to 13 in this passage david is coming to the end of his rule is handing over his government to his son solomon and uh, he prays to god uh, as he is handing over the the mantle or the powers i mean the the instruments of power and verse 10 says david praised the lord in the presence of the whole assembly saying praise be to you lord the god of our father israel from everlasting to everlasting he is saying praise to god from everlasting to everlasting more like what he has written in psalm 145 and he tells us 
yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. All things are yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. I love that statement. That just like the head is above the shoulders, everything else in the body, God is exalted above everything else. He that has everything and owns everything, he is lifted up and he is honoring God in this way. He continues in verse 12 to say, wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. God is worthy of honor and wealth come from him. He is the one who gives people opportunities. He's the one who raises people to high levels of honor. Wow. And he closes by saying, now our God, we give you thanks and praise you or adore you or worship your glorious name. Because of this, because of who you are and what you do, we give you praise. We also give you thanks for your glorious name. What a wonderful way of exalting God, adoring God. And we need to learn to do this. David continues to pray for other things thereafter, but he starts with worship. May we learn to be worshiping God. Another one is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 30, uh, 28. He says, this is Isaiah writing, Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. The Lord is the everlasting God. He is not a moment or a, mem a God who is there just for a moment. He is continuously God. He is unchanging and he is the creator of the ends of the earth. He should have said the galaxies. He will not grow tired or weary. And he will go on to say, and those who wait upon the Lord, verse 30, uh, he will say that, uh, they that wait upon the Lord renew their strength. They mount up with wings as eagles. They run and are not weary. Why will he say that? Because God who is never tired and is never weary is the one that renews their strength. And he is worshiping God in this or he's helping us to understand who God is. And he's, he, he says that the understanding of God, no one can fathom. No one can get to the depths of it. I want to close by going back to Psalms 145 verse 3, which says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. God is beyond discovery. This gives us the perspective that no matter our experiences in life, and the realities that we have faced in life, they are so limited when we compare them to who God is. God is beyond those experiences. God is beyond those realities. He is a mighty God. And because of that, he is deserving of praise, of adoration. He is worthy to be exalted. The reason I have shared this is because I would want us to be men and women that are obedient to this, that we are giving ourselves to worshiping God even before we get to the place where we are asking him, give me this, give me the other. We should not treat God like an ATM where you put a prayer, a petition, and you withdraw what you are looking for or a supermarket where we go to get things. God needs to be honored, to be exalted. So how can we become better in this? I would suggest that we need to read and meditate on scriptures on adoration. And the richest book in the Bible 
you know it will be found in many other places like i have said we have quoted isaiah uh, but the richest book as far as adoration is concerned is the book of psalms if you can read through the psalms there are psalms that stand out as psalms of adoration and you could learn to adopt those words in your prayer life you could use them remember that you need to mean them it is not rote that you're invited to you are invited to use those words when you mean them from the heart i think you could also craft your own words as you read those words let them inspire you to come up with your own words of adoration but more importantly look to your heart in the book of uh, second corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 the bible says that when we come to christ we become new creatures we are we are different from what we were and that we that new creation is because we have taken what was wrong and put what is right so let us learn to examine our hearts take away what will hinder our worship anger resentment unforgiveness jealousy malice all those things let's place joy there let's place the word of god let the mind of christ dwell in us richly in our hearts because our hearts involves the mind the will the emotions let's put that in our hearts and it will become easier to worship god acceptably and we will be heard and god will come through for us over time obviously you will find that you improve in the habit of worship may god help you as you uh, uh effect what we have learned today practice it and god will make you a great worshiper remember jesus said that god seeks true worshipers the question the begging question are you the person that god will find when he is looking for true worshipers let us pray heavenly father we thank you for your word that is sharper than a double-edged sword that never returns to you void but is able to fulfill that for uh, for which you sent it i pray for all my listeners those who will hear this even in days to come through the social media or whatever uh, means <clears throat> whatever means they will get to hear this i pray that you are going to use this word to minister to them and to help them to become true worshipers the kind that you seek i thank you and i bless you and i honor you for you are a good god it's in jesus's name i have prayed and i believe amen amen god bless you looking forward to meeting with you next time when we are talking about the prayer of confession what a wonderful message from our deputy bishop karita mbagara so please share your takeaway points in the chat section but for now i'd like us to pause and take some time in prayer and we know as sitam we've been having our 14 days of prayer and fasting and in the last week we were focusing on thanksgiving we were focusing on repentance and we were focusing on our families and so today i'd like us to take a few minutes and just present our adoration to the lord thank him for what he has done for you thank him for his goodness for his faithfulness and for his loving kindness we also want to go into a time of repentance and we want to ask the lord wash us cleanse us purify us and have mercy because against you lord only have we sinned and then mention your family to the lord Dear Lord, we are grateful this day that we're able to come into your presence. You say that we come and enter your gates with thanksgiving in our hearts. We say that we come into your courts with praise. And Father, we are grateful today for everything that you have done for us, Lord. You have been faithful, you have been good, oh God. You have watched over us, you have kept us, you have protected us. You have been with us, oh Lord. And as a psalmist would say, if the Lord was not on my side, then the enemy would have consumed me. Father, we thank you that even in the difficult economic times, 
you have provided for us Jehovah you have shielded us King of glory you have brought our children back safely from the schools and so father for that we give you thanks we give you honor we give you praise and we give you adoration declaring that Lord there is no one else who is worthy to receive honor praise and glory and blessing but you King of Kings and Lord of Lords and so we humble ourselves today in your presence and we acknowledge that Lord God Almighty that we have sinned in various ways oh Lord and father we come in humility we come in repentance pleading the blood of Jesus for you say that if we confess our sins to you oh God you are faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us of all our righteous unrighteousness oh God and we're praying that father today that Lord you would wash us from every injustice the Lord has taken place in this land for you say that sin is a reproach oh God but you say that righteousness exalts our nation we pray that Lord you would forgive us where we have slumbered in the place of prayer oh God we pray that you would forgive us oh God where as families our altars have not been vibrant king of glory and we're asking that you would set us on fire once again in the name of Jesus Christ we are asking that Lord in this nation in your wrath won't you remember mercy in the name of Jesus where there has been immorality king of glory where there has been greed where there has been injustice oh God where there has been infidelity where there has been adultery father we are asking remember mercy and wash us and cleanse us from every one of our sins oh God we present ourselves to you and we want to declare over this nation king of glory we are returning to you in the name of Jesus Christ our families our homes are returning back to you our young people our children are returning back to you in the name of Jesus as we take this time to pray and to seek your face oh God you will do things that are beyond our understanding and so we thank you and we honor you King of glory for it is in Jesus mighty name we trust and we believe amen amen
truly all honor, all glory and power belongs to you, Lord. And we join the 24 elders, Lord. We join the angels, we join the heavenly hosts in blessing you, Lord God Almighty. Receive the sacrifice of worship that has been lifted to you, Lord. May it rise as a sweet-smelling incense to you, Lord. And Father, we thank you even for the giving of your people. And we ask that, Lord, even as they give to you, that, Lord God Almighty, may you be glorified. We ask that the funds will be used for your kingdom, for your glory, and for your fame. We pray all this trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. It is now time to express our worship to God through giving. Thank you for your continued support of God's work here at Sidom. We believe that God, who sees in secret, will reward you openly and abundantly. We have a common payment platform for all our giving, irrespective of which assembly you happen to attend and even for our visitors. You can give via mobile money through the platforms M-Pesa or Airtel Money. The pay bill number for either system is 933934. For the account name, please indicate the SITEM assembly you attend. If you have joined us in this service but you are not a member of any SITEM assembly, just write offering in the account space. Please remember that all all other SITEM PayPal numbers remain operational. If you would like to make direct bank deposits, electronic transfers or PESA link, please use the following account. Account name, Christ is the Answer Ministries, Cooperative Bank, University Way Branch and the account number is 011-280-617-639-0. The SWIFT code K C double O K E N A. If you prefer to give through our website, kindly visit www.sitem.org. Click on the Give tab and follow the instruction for online giving. Once again, we want to appreciate every one of you for every gift, every tithe, every offering, and every generous material support. God bless you. Thank you very much for joining us today in our CBS family service. Remember to join us on Tuesday from 6 p.m. for the After Sunday Live, where we'll be with today's speaker, Deputy Bishop Karita Mbagara, as he answers your questions on today's message, Prayer of Adoration. And on Wednesday, you can join us again at 6 p.m., where we will have a live prayer service. And you can send in your prayer requests, and our pastors will be available to pray with you. So please keep tweeting, please keep posting, and share the link for today's message. Remember to use the hashtag, let's adore, let's adore. And remember to use the annual Bible study prayer guide, and this week you can use it for further study on our theme.